So one of the things I wanted to mention first of all is that we do, during this presentation, have a number of code examples come up. So if you're at the back, you may not be able to see those. Um, I would suggest either moving forward if you want to, or if you're looking for the quick exit, that's absolutely fine. Um, the video will be available afterwards. We'll obviously make sure all the code we use here is on our blogs, on the Power CLI blog, and available to anybody that needs it. Uh, we're really excited to be here today, as always, to talk to you about Power CLI. I love the community. I love the comments that I get back from you guys. Um, let's kick it off. We've got a jam-packed agenda. So we have the normal disclaimer slide. I'm sure everybody has seen this and has it tattooed on the side of their arm by now. I know I do. Uh, but basically, it says that um, I can say anything I want right here, right now, and you're not allowed to believe any of it because I could change my mind tomorrow. <laughs> or, you know, legal, legal jargon around that anyway. <laughs> uh, so today, we want to talk to you about a few things, and we've kind of put it into some sections. So first of all, we're going to obviously do our normal welcome. And, and just a reminder, this is a deep dive. We don't mind if you're here and you're kind of, okay, I want to learn Power CLI, but I wouldn't suggest that this is the exact session that you need to be in. I would, I would think this is more of a deep dive and we're going to get quite, quite heavy pretty quick. Um, we do, however, first of all, have a quick section that reminds the people that are new to Power CLI what it's all about, what problems it solves, and how you can get started. The next point is a technical preview, and there's some really exciting stuff in there that I've been waiting for VMworld because every single time I stand up here and I ask you guys, what do you want me to do next? Some of that stuff is in here, so I'm really excited to present that to you and show you this working. Uh, we're then going to move on to some desired state configuration, and this is not desired state configuration from VMware themselves, but this is actually some of the community stuff that Luke, and Luke has put together that he will make available to other people. We're going to go through some of the best practices, and that's really where the deep dive part kicks in. It gets you know, pretty deep. And then we'll obviously spare some time for Q&A. So I would ask you to keep your Q&A until the last, uh, the last part, and then use the mics that are available to, to ask those questions. And then Luke and I will be available after the session to obviously uh, catch up with you if, you if you're shy. So first of all, I want to uh, talk to you about Luke Deakins. I've presented to, with him for a number of years now. And I, as I'm, uh, you know, every single year I say, if you've ever been to the communities and logged a post, you know, he answers it within four seconds. Um, I think this year it's like three seconds. So you know, we're not only improving the product, we're improving Luke as well. <laughs> the script. The script. <laughs> So, you know, if you haven't been to his site, then write it down right now. Go there right now, bookmark it, you know, make sure you visit it every single day. Uh, well, you don't actually blog every single day, but <laughs> make sure you go there and you read some of this stuff and go back through some of his earlier articles as well. LukeD.info is a wealth of information. And believe me, when I was a customer, I used to visit that site and steal some of Luke's scripts as well. So it's absolutely fine to go there and steal that stuff. You might have to buy him a beer, of course, while you're here, but, you know. But not all at the same time, because that will be a bit <laughs> of a problem. Okay, I'm, I'm glad that Alan mentioned stealing, because that's what it's in fact all about. Okay, we don't call it stealing, it's community sharing that we're doing. You will find a lot of stuff available on this uh, PowerCLI VMTN community. There's a lot of blocks available. You don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. PowerShell, and especially PowerCLI here, is about the community. Now, my co-presenter for several years, as he already mentioned, is uh, Alan Renouf. I think most of you, are, if not all, know him. He's the guy who notes down all your questions, desires, requests, and so on. And if you have any, make sure he knows them. He has a big book of them. He orders them in importance, and then he will make sure that it is implemented. How, uh, long, uh, it, how long it will take, that, that is indetermined. And I would, pres I would prefer that they were like Power CLI or API related requests. I, I, mean, do I don't, that I don't just handle any request. Like. Okay. <laughs> That's new. He used to do everything before. <laughs> like, give me a house. <laughs> give me a car. <laughs> Now, Alan is, is working for VMware since a couple of years, and he recently got uh, his portfolio extended quite extensively. He's now the product line manager uh, for all things CLI, SDK, APIs. Correct. Did I forget anything? I don't think so. We got all the three-letter acronyms in there. That's more than enough. Then. 
Uh, he has his own personal blog that you probably all know. He has very famous scripts on there, the VCheck. Uh, who is using VCheck here? See, Alan. Awesome. That's a community script now, by the way, not okay. my script anymore. No, but you started it. Uh, he has the snap reminder and he has several others. So uh, follow him on Twitter and have a look at his uh, blog, which he still maintains, not as frequent as before anymore, <laughs> but he does do some new stuff on there. Okay, Alan said this is not an introduction, this is a deep dive, but the only s introduction that you will get is, is this slide and it will last about two minutes. Okay, this is a bit of artsy fartsy that Alan created in one tool. <laughs> but, but what you see here is the basic commandlets or, or <laughs> some kind of representation of the basic commandlets. As you most, okay, if you're a beginner or you never used Power CLI, there's still time to leave the room. This goes a bit further than this. Okay, nobody left, great. Uh, just uh, a, a small summary. There are the commandlets with which you normally start. These are the get commandlets, which is quite obvious stuff that allows you to retrieve information from your environment. Then you go one step further. Once you mastered all these get commandlets, you go to the step where you start creating stuff in your vSphere environment. That's where you start using new commandlets. And there's a bunch of these. And then finally, you discover that your new was not exactly like you wanted it to be. You will have to change stuff. That's where you will be using the set commandlets, where you change existing objects in your vSphere environment and you change them through a commandlet. What is very important is this stuff covers nearly everything, not everything, but nearly everything that you need to do as an administrator in your vSphere environment. And this concludes the two minutes of intro on Power CLI. <laughs> so now it's over to Alan with some very exciting stuff then. So the first thing I wanted to mention is a technical preview of Power CLI. And you can see from this slide, we already cover a number of different products through Power CLI. We expose their APIs. As Luke said, what we do is actually take the API and make it easier to use. System administrators don't want to be looking at APIs. You don't want to write 80 lines of code to, to create a virtual machine. You want to use new-vm. So what we do is we started with vSphere, obviously, and then we've, through the years, expanded on the product, and we've kept going, we've kept going. We now cover things like image builder and auto deploy so that you can manage the entire life cycle of your hosts. Uh, we cover vCenter and ESX. We cover some of the EUC products, Horizon View, Horizon Mirage was recently bought out as well. So if you're working with those products, make sure you check out the command notes. Site Recovery Manager was something we came out with recently. vCloud Director, vCloud Air, Update Manager, Storage Commanders. We keep going with all of the commandments that you guys want and ask me for year on year. And this year, I'm really excited to announce that we've got some additions in here. The number one question I get whenever I finish my session at, at VMworld, or I do vMugs, or I talk to customers, and I'm like, OK, where do we go next? What do you want? What do you want? The number one thing they say is vRealize operations. Anybody say that to me? OK, not as many as I thought. Come on, anybody say that to me? <laughs> I know, you, I know a lot of you did. <laughs> so I know you're using vRealize operations at the moment. And you look at that data in there in the nice UI, and you think, wouldn't it be great if I could actually export this stuff and use this stuff? Wouldn't it be great if I can interrogate vRealize operations to find out in a scripted way what my virtual machines are doing or what issues I have and, and take actions on those, maybe? Well, now you can. Some of the other additions, and I'll go through these in more detail in a moment, are Hardware information. This is a, a case where a lot of you are saying, OK, well, you know, you, we've, we can see the hardware there in the UI, but when I try and find it through PowerCLI, it's quite complicated to actually find that information. And guess what? You guys keep bringing out new versions of uh, vSphere and, and ESX. And then every time I need to go and check the hardware compatibility list to say, OK, is this on the hardware compatibility list? So I need to go through everything that's in my host and then check that it's still supported. Well, this is a way that you can actually interrogate your hosts now and find out things like serial numbers and, um, and tags uh, of the actual hardware assets um, and the information of the, the devices that are inside there and pull that back and work with those in a scripted way. We've also made enhancements to the storage side of things. We've introduced a number of different commandments that work with things like VASA and NFS and VAO, uh, all the V acronyms that we come up with for storage. 
Um, and you can go out there and, and learn more about these features, but basically when it comes to Power CLI, all you need to know is you can automate that stuff. And in the uh, vCloud Air segment, we've got a number of different customers using on-demand now, so being able to spin up individual virtual machines and be charged by the virtual machine rather than the capacity that they, the, the actual buying the resources. So you can now work with on-demand as well. And this is really quick, but I'm going to go through some of these sections right now. And it's not just that as well. We've, we've made a number of different enhancements that I'm talking about in this technical preview. You know for a while that we've been working on modules. It was, again, something that people wanted me to work on. Everybody's moving to modules. It makes sense, right? So we've made even further enhancements, and you'll find even more modules in there. Now, I don't want to disappoint you. We're not at the point yet where we are 100% modules, but we're getting there. There's a couple of little lingering ones that I'm trying to sort out right now but we're getting there, so we're moving in the right direction. So we already spoke about the new storage commandlets that are in there, managing vCloud Air, update vCloud Air, um, updated vCloud Air commandlets to work with networking, make that a lot easier, host hardware information, update manager enhancements, which I'll talk about in a moment, support for SRM 6.1, and the license snapping converted to a module, so even, even less snappings there now. So let's go a little bit more into detail. Okay, what is there for vRealize operations? So as, as some of you may know, and this is where the deep dive stuff kicks in, um, as some of you may know, the first thing we do when we expose a product from VMware is we, we create something called low-level API access or low-level commandlets. Now, the people in the room that have used GetView, who's used GetView? Wow, this is a deep dive session. There's lots of people. <laughs> So get view is really that way to abstract the entire contents of what's in the API, but it's harder to use. You have to actually need to know what's going on, right? And we have a great section later on where Luke actually will explain to you how you can learn how to use get view and relate that back to our documentation. But you'll know that when we cover a new product, what we do first of all is we actually give you access to everything that's in that API. So what I'm talking about with the full low-level API access is really the view access so that you can access the entire API, do whatever you want, but it is slightly harder. Once we've done that, we go back and we make it easier. So we build those high-level commandlets on top of those, that low-level access, and we give you the easier ways to work with the API. Rather than the 80 lines of code to create a new virtual machine, we give you a new VM commandlet, right? So what we're doing in VROps is going through and creating a bunch of new commandlets to abstract those higher level use cases, maybe call a couple of APIs for you to be able to do what you need to do. So things like retrieving alerts, changing alerts, retrieving statistics, I mean, that's the biggest one in here. Everybody wants to know exactly what that VM is doing, and people look at it from different angles and like, okay, well, I want to know about the networking, but he wants to know about the CPU usage, and it was the CPU usage last Tuesday at six o'clock at night, and you know, all that kind of information. So uh, working with the statistics and retrieving the recommendations as well. And what we've done as well is uh, we've made it easier to use because we could just expose the, 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 the commandlets that are uh, available for vRealize operations. But what we've done is we've fully integrated them with our current commandlets as well. So they're pipeline enabled. So what you can do is get a data store and then pipeline that through to the command that actually gets the information about that from VR ops. So it's very natural, and it works very well together. You can see from the screen what I'm talking about. We have the commandlets listed at the top, and I'm not going to go through every single one. You, I went through what they, what they, the general areas that they covered, um, and I do have a demonstration on this at the moment so that you can get an understanding of how they work. But you can also see the example code on the screen as well. And, and don't forget, this will be available afterwards. We'll make sure everybody gets it. Um, believe me, I'll be shouting this stuff from the rooftop because I'm really excited about it. Um, but you can see how natural it is to use it with our current commands as well, pipelining them through, passing the host object through to the um, ob uh, operations manager resource commander, and then getting the operation manager stats and relating that down to really the key one that I'm interested in and then telling it when I want it from as well. So it really is very easy to use these commandlets, and hopefully if you've been using PowerCLI for a while, you'll be able to pick these up and run with them straight away. I know I was able to do that, and I'm a product manager. 
Okay, well, you're not supposed to laugh so loud, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's switch over the uh, laptops and I'll take you through a demonstration of how this actually works. Yep. Are we good? We're good. Okay, so you can see on my screen I have a, uh, the in, in ISE, the script editor, open. And if I do a get command, and I list the module for vRealize operations, you'll see all the vRealize operations command lists that I have available to me. And there's the obvious ones in there, like connect OM server, disconnect OM server, but then there's the command lists that we would use. So in my script, I'm obviously connecting to my virtual infrastructure, and then I'm connecting to my operations manager server. And then what we're going to do is get a list of the status of, of a specific virtual machine. So instantly you can see that I've brought back the, uh, I'm using a get VM to, to get my virtual machine called Photon1. And then I'm piping that through to the get OM resource commandlet, which basically says go to operations manager and get me the resource statistics for this virtual machine. So straight away, it gives you the, the basic information, the kind of information that you would see when you first open up the uh, Operations Manager UI, and that's the, the basic health, right? And these are just the properties that show uh, on the screen. There's a bunch more um, properties as part of that object if you explore it a bit more. And obviously, we can do that for a number of virtual machines as well. Let's get the um, Operations Manager resource for all of my virtual machines. We can uh, double check that everything's OK and it's all green. And it's obviously not just virtual machines as well. Operation Manager actually looks at your data stores, it looks at your networks, it looks at your clusters, it aggregates all that information together, does all the clever stuff and tells you where the issues are. So you can see I've done a get data store and I've got a red one here. Okay, there's something up with this data store. So let's actually go a little bit deeper and find out what's going on there. And you can see if I go to the UI, it is indeed red. It's the same information that I'm retrieving. So let's list the data stores with a health problem, and all I'm doing there is exactly the same as before, but I'm saying give me the data stores that have a health of anything other than green, and I've found my data store. And then we can actually start and, and pipe that through to the get OM alert to find out, okay, what's actually going on with this data store? Why is there a problem? And you can see actually this data store has lost its connectivity to a storage device, and it's a, you know, it's a critical error. And obviously, we can, filter those, we can filter those options, we can export them, we can use them in different ways. You know, we can find out all the virtual machines that have issues uh, with CPU or with memory, and we can take action on those. Uh, you know, really, the, 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 uh, the use cases here are down to you and your scripting abilities and how you would use these commandlets. These are just examples of what I'm showing you here. So let's get a little bit more uh, in depth and actually list the active alerts. So we can list the active alerts for everything in our infrastructure, and we can see actually where all the issues are very easily. Um, and then we could maybe report that out or push it into another data source or you know, bring it up in a web page, do whatever you need to. And then I want to show you an example of the um, OM stack commander. So what we're doing here is we're getting our virtual machine, which is, an, which is called important app. And inside that virtual machine, I've actually just run a CPU stress test so that it's actually doing something. Um, so you can see there where I kicked it off, it went to 65% and now it's staying on 100%. And we're using the get, get OM stack commandlet to specifically look at the CPU and find out, okay, what's going on with this and give me the list of statistics over time. And then what we can do is we can actually, we can format that as well, and we can do uh, another statement that says, okay, give me a list of all of the CPUs where the CPU usage is over 30%, maybe narrow that down a little bit more, you know, tell me about the problem virtual machines that I have in my environment or the, the VMs that are using their CPU very heavily. And the last thing I wanted to show you was the, the initial comment that I made about the, um, the, the get view type way of accessing the entire API. Until now, I've showed you the high level commandlets. You'll see that there was no get OM view. Well, what you would do here is uh, when you connect to the virtual infrastructure, you know you get the dollar global uh, colon VI servers, which lists all of the virtual infrastructure servers that you're connected to. 
Well, likewise, you get the dollar VM OM, uh, default OM servers, which actually gives you a list of all of the operations manager servers that you can, you're connected to, because you can connect to more than one at once. So once we've brought that up, what I can actually do is investigate that as well, because it's not just the connection information we store in that, in that uh, variable, in that global variable. If I do a select star, you'll see there's a bunch more information in there, one of them being the extension data. Now, if you've been in our sessions previously or if you've used um, Power CLI extensively, you'll know that the extension data property is that way of accessing the entire API for an object. So it's actually go back to the API and get me all of the data for this object. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the extension data to find out, OK, what can we actually do with this API? So we'll do the same as before, but instead we'll do a dot, uh, we'll, we'll call the first one in our infrastructure, and then we'll call the extension data. You can see it's an object. And we'll pipe it through to get member. Everybody aware of what get member is? It's the commandlet that goes out there and says, OK, tell me about this object that I have. You know, tell me what methods are there. Tell me what properties are there so that I can actually work with this stuff. Well, the, you can see from the, uh, from the screen that actually we have a bunch of different methods and a bunch of different properties in there that really do open up the entire API. And this is where you would actually break out the guide that you need for uh, the operations manager API and maybe look at that specific thing that you want to do, see how they do it in their API. Or you could still explore it through this. You could call some of the methods very easily, and you could mess around with them and fumble your way through until you have some working code. But the idea is we've got these high-level commandlets that make it easier for you, but we've still got that low-level access to give you exactly everything you need from Operations Manager. So moving back and moving on, and hopefully that was uh, exciting to you. I know it's, it's definitely something I've been looking forward to telling you about. Um, I, again, you know, this is the number one thing that people ask me for when, uh, when I come to VMworld, so it's pretty cool stuff. I've included the examples here so that when you get the deck afterwards, you can kind of see what I did there, and it just takes you through the entire code. We do that for each of the videos that we have here. So moving on, I, I, men, I mentioned storage. We've obviously updated our storage module. So we're covering even more of the aspects in, um, in our storage module, which actually opens up the new VASA providers. It enables you to list the registered VASA providers, and it'll enable you to work with those and unregister those as well. So really automating the entire storage infrastructure and what you want to do with that. You'll know that. It, we released a fling that had the NFS user command that's in there. And people always say to me, you know, these flings are great. And, and for those of you that don't know what a fling is, it's basically a way for VMware to write code um, and to give you stuff in an unsupported manner to kind of test it out and say, OK, do you like this stuff? It doesn't make sense. Or it's a way for our developers to work on something that they think the users want and then actually um, gain feedback on that or you know, show them cool stuff that we, that we do. It's where a lot of our innovation actually goes into as well. Um, so the NFS user commandlets were actually part of a fling that we released a while back, but they've been brought back into the product now. You know, we got good feedback on those. People were using those, but we don't want to just leave it in an unsupported manner. What we've done is pulled that back into the, the uh, technical preview, and you'll be able to access that and work with NFS. And then we have updated commandlets for working with I.O. filters. In the last release, we brought out a bunch of commandlets that allow you to add I.O. filters, to remove I.O. filters, monitor the I.O. filters that are on there. But actually, using this, you can now update them as well. Again, the examples are on the screen, and the list of the commandlets that we now have for working with storage is available there. Um, I'm not going to go through a demonstration on this. What I want to talk about is actually the vCloud Air commandlets. So the vCloud Air is, is, a, is a great way to um, spin up extra resources. And you, you've seen from the keynotes as we've been talking about it, it's, it's key to our future. Uh, and one of the things that we talk about is the, that kind of single pane of glass, being able to manage your infrastructure, whether it's on your uh, on-premises data center or whether it's in vCloud Air, manage it in exactly the same way, work with it in exactly the same way, and you don't have to lose the skills that you already have. And that plays well to exactly vCloud Air as well. 
you can actually use your same shell to access not only your on-premises infrastructure, but also your vCloud Air environment and run your Power, C Power CLI commandlets against both environments at the same time and work with those environments. Uh, it's a very easy thing to do, and it's kind of one of those things where at first, I know first of all, I was like, well, this stuff's in the cloud. You know, surely I have to manage it in a different way. Uh, I have to work with it in a different way. But it really does bring these commandlets uh, into your current shell and allows you to use those. Um, so I'll show you a quick demonstration of that. Sorry, bear with me. Okay. We're good. And you can see that I'm actually going to do some hybrid reporting here. So I'm actually going to manage my local infrastructure, my on-premises infrastructure, as well as my vCloud Air environment. And the first thing that we're going to do is connect to the virtual infrastructure server. The next thing we're going to do is connect to our public infrastructure server with vCloud Air parameter, which connects you to the on-demand. Once we've done that, we're going to actually get a list of the compute instances that are in um, vCloud Air, because you could have access to multiple different areas. Um, in this case, I'm going to look at the California region, and I'm going to select the actual inst uh, compute instance that I want to work with. Again, there's a number of different ways of doing this stuff. This is just an example piece of code where I'm doing a specific task. You know, you could pipe that stuff to out grid view and get somebody to select it. Um, we've got some blogs on our site that show you how to do that. So once we've got our compute instance, I'll connect to that compute instance. And then we'll have our connection to vCloud Air. So let's run through those. OK, let's not. Let's talk about the next line of code, which actually gets the uh, virtual machine, the name, the power state. So the idea is that I want to do some basic reporting, right? I want to actually bring back a list of all of my virtual machines, as in, I don't care where they're hosted. Are they on vSphere? Are they in vCloud Air? I don't care. I just need that reporting. I need that one central place that gives me a list of all of my virtual machines. So what we're going to do is do a get VM, first of all, and list the name, the power state, the memory, the number of CPUs, the guest OS, and the location. And in this case, the location will be the cluster. And we will also add another entry in there called platform as well, using a calculated property, and actually say the, the platform is the vSphere and then the, the vCenter name, in my case. And then you can see what I was talking about. In the same script, we're actually going to call out to vCloud Air, and we're going to do a get CI VM to get the cloud infrastructure virtual machines. And then we're going to select similar properties. We're going to select the name, the power state, the memory, the number of CPUs, the guest OS, exactly the same information that we collected before. But instead of the cluster being the location, we're actually going to use the vCloud Air organizational VDC, which makes more sense in this case. And we're going to call the, we're going to create the platform as well, and we're going to call the platform vCloud Air, but we're going to use the compute instance um, region. So you can see that the two lines of code are very similar. It's nothing that you can't pick up instantly if you start working with vCloud Air. Then what we're going to do is we're going to create an empty array. We're going to obviously add these both to the empty array so that we've got both lists in one array. And then we can work with that array. We can either export it to CSV. We can list it to the screen, as I'm doing there. Uh, we, could, we could do whatever we want to that, whether it's push it into a database or create some nice graphs, put it in X, um, Excel. The idea is that we're, we're running this against both infrastructures. So I'll click Play. And you can see it's going to run through my script. It's going to connect to my virtual infrastructure, my vCloud Air environment. And then it's going to pull back that data. And it's going to show it on the screen, first of all, in a consolidated list. So I've instantly got all of my virtual machine information. This may be a demo, but it's real time. <laughs> <laughs> So you can see now we've got, an, we've got a list of our information. We can see not only the vCloud Air, but the on-premises uh, data. And we can see the location and the platform. Um, and the platform's kind of cut off because I increased the font so that people could see it. But if I, uh, I could list that and, and work with that empty array that we created just by selecting the name 
and the platform to show you that it's filled those out as well. And then obviously, you know, we've exported that into a CSV, so it's very easy to bring that into an Excel spreadsheet and then instantly have a list of the information. So hopefully from the demonstration, you've seen how easy it is to work with not only your existing infrastructure, but when you start looking at the cloud and moving to the cloud and working with vCloud Air, how easy it is to connect to that and use your existing scripting skills to work with both environments at the same time. Again, we include the code so that you can take this back and actually use it if you want. It's not stealing, it's sharing. And you can take it beyond that as well. I mean, that was just a very simple example, but we had a number of people raise their hands when they said they used VCheck. This is something I put together within about 20 minutes, which basically, instead of calling your virtual infrastructure server, calls the vCloud Air server um, and reports on that information that you have in vCloud Air. It's a very easy way to list all of the vCloud Air information and produce nice graphs and bring back a vCheck format to the vCloud Air environment. So you, again, you are managing your infrastructure in exactly the same way. Uh, and it's on GitHub as well. So obviously, you know, Luke said, I created the script. I did initially with a bunch of other people. And then we pushed it into um, a GitHub account. There's one for the vSphere edition, but there's also one for the vCloud Air edition. So you can go in there, you can take a look at what we're doing, and you can use this stuff, and you can alter it, and you can contribute back as well, which is always the good bit. In fact, while we're here, um, this is like totally off key. Um, <laughs> so while we're here, the vCheck script, um, I, I had an email from somebody the other day, and this is what I love about the GitHub repository and why I opened it up. I had an email from somebody the other day saying, oh, I've created 70 new plugins, um, and I'm going to put them in there. And, and what they've done is they've been through the hardening guide and basically created an entry in there for each uh, plugin in the VCheck script for each of the hardening guides. So it's, it's not been committed yet because there was a couple of things that I suggested they changed. But basically, this is like somebody feeding back to the, to the stuff that I've put in there, but they're adding um, 70 new checks in there straight away so that everybody can take advantage of and run against their environment. So I mentioned the host hardware information uh, very briefly. And this is, you know, the screen on the left is where you can see it in the web client at the moment. You can go into there and you can see, okay, what processes are in my machine? What's going on with my machine? Uh, you know, what, what, what hardware do I have? And again, this is used for the checking against the hardware compatibility list or checking your cluster. You know, do I have similar hardware in my cluster? Um, do I have the same um, hardware so that I can actually use it in, in a, 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 a better way? Because we all know that it, uh, clusters work better when the hardware is very similar and has the same information, right? Um, so I'm going to bring up a demonstration of how to use that. And you can see in this script, we are going to, the, the commandlets themselves are very easy to use. We're going to connect to our virtual infrastructure server, as always. And then we have this new get VM host hardware commander. So what we're able to do is get the host, and I'm getting the hosts where they're powered on, obviously. Um, and I'm going to do a get host hardware. I'm going to skip the SSL certification checks because my host doesn't have a signed certificate on it. Uh, but it will basically hook into the, uh, the host, and it will pull back the initial information. So get host hardware instantly returns back things like the serial number and the asset tag, if I had that on my server and filled it out in the BIOS. Um, but also things like the CPU model and some more of the basic information that you see kind of at the top of the, the, the UI in the screen. And then we have the, the other additional command as well, which is the get host PCI device, which will actually go into your host and say, OK, what PCI devices do you have attached? And initially, Luke wrote a great script that, uh, that did this and went out and checked. That, you know, I think he pulled down a list of the hardware from the internet and matched that against the ID and, and 
did weird and wonderful things. Uh, so we've done those same weird and wonderful things, but now it's in a supported manner. Uh, so you can go out to your hosts, you can run this, this get VM host PCI device and instantly list the information that's on there. And as I said, it's very easy to take that and actually compare your hosts in your infrastructure. You can see I've you know, spent a couple of minutes here just to get the hosts that are in a specific cluster. And in my case, I only have two hosts, so it's very easy for me to test. Uh, this is my home environment. Yes, I'm sad enough to have a home environment. And what we're doing here is basically retrieving the information. So we're retrieving both hosts into an object. We're retrieving the host PCI devices that are in there and storing it in each of the variables. And then we're going to compare both of those variables. And it will spit out the list of the hardware. And it will give us a, um, a field along the right-hand side that says, OK, is this in both of those? And obviously, I'm a good home nerd. And both of my hosts are exactly the same. So um, you'll see a bunch of equals next to them that list, that list the, uh, the hardware that's in there and the fact that it's in both of those. But you can see how easy it is to actually use these commandlets to compare your infrastructure and work with this to, to really list the list of devices that are in there. So moving on, update manager. This is one of those things that's always been a separate installer, and it's been, uh, whenever I talk to people about it, they're like, yeah, I like the update manager commandlets. Now, when I spoke to people about it before the last release, it was, why does it only work with PowerCLI version 2? Uh, sorry, PowerShell version 2. I can't really use that because I've updated my PowerShell version. So in the last release, we updated that. In this release, uh, so now, you know, obviously the questions have moved on a touch now, and it's all about, well, I still have to go download that version of update manager commandlets that are actually specific for the version of update manager that I have installed in my virtual center, because you don't offer the same backwards compatibility that you do generally in, v in uh, PowerCLI commandlets for vSphere. So we've made enhancements here. We've actually backwards compatibility enabled these to work. So when this technical preview comes out as a product, you will see that you are now able to install the latest version and still work with your 5.5 update manager hosts. It means you don't have to go out there and separately install the update manager commandlets. In fact, we've even bundled them into the installer so that you can select them and install them as you go along. It's just making it one step easier for people to install it and also to work in their environment so they don't have a bunch of extra steps and they don't have to make sure that if they're managing a version of ESX or a version of Virtual Center with um, Update Manager 5.5, a version of um, Update Manager 6.0, you know, it becomes hard in that circumstance because you want to really connect to both and do the same things. Um, this is something, again, that a lot of people have asked me for. In fact, I have a weekly email from somebody that's in this audience. I will not name them, but I have a weekly email asking me for this. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over to Luke now, and he's going to go, if you thought I was deep, just get ready. <laughs> <laughs> this is very exciting stuff, what Ellen is announcing. Ellen, just to make sure this is not yet available at the moment. It's this not yet available. That's the technical and, preview part And of you it. don't talk about dates, so... I don't talk about dates well, at all, no. Just wait it out, but I'm very excited with all this stuff that is going to come. In fact, this is another big leap step in, in, in the direction of automating your environment. And this morning, by accident, I saw a tweet passing by. Uh, it's not like the CEO or the VP would say it. Shut up and automate everything. <laughs> and I thought that described rather well. I don't know if the guy is in the, in the room at the moment, but that described very well what, what we are doing here. We are touching so many individual components, and we are giving you the opportunity to automate everything that, that you see in your environment. Now, the next thing, and this is where we're going to touch something that, that Microsoft uh, has uh, been pushing since uh, PowerShell 4, and which now will be a lot more performant than PowerShell 5, is uh, the desired state configuration. How many of you have already played with desired state configuration? Oh, quite a few. And in production, probably not. Test, play, test, dev. Okay. Uh, we have been playing with it for quite some while, what 
we would advise you is, is to at least go for PowerShell 5, PowerShell 4, had it, but it's, it's, in my opinion, quite limited. It doesn't offer you all the possibilities. By accident, yesterday evening, uh, Microsoft announced the official release of the product preview. So also their PowerShell 5 will be rather short in the, in the future that you will have access to it uh, for your, your platform. So at least wait for PowerShell 5. The new features that they added really uh, justify it. So what do you need to do that? Uh, PowerShell by itself, of course. And of course, you need uh, an editor to uh, configure your configurations. Luckily, what they did in, in PowerShell 5 even more with the ISZ that is delivered with PowerShell, you have even the IntelliSense for everything that is DSC related. So you just can type your configuration, uh, see what options you have, and just fill in the templates uh, what you are uh, trying to define. So Luke, just to, just to yeah. back up a touch, for those in the room that don't know what DSC is, I was, what does it actually enable you to do? OK, I was coming to that. Uh, that's the next point. I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, there are two. <laughs> I'll just go away. There are two ways of doing this. And, and what it is doing now, I will answer Alan's question first. What it is doing, you define part of your configuration. You say, for example, on this server, I want the web server service running. You define that once there is an agent running on that server, and it will look at regular intervals if that service is still there. If it's not, it will install it. If somebody uninstalls it by accident, it will reinstall it. So uh, now I jump to the end of this, of this bulleted list. Uh, the second one to the last, make it so. That is a famous, uh, I think it comes from Star Trek, but uh, Jeffrey Snover has been using it a lot more than, than the Star Trek episodes lately. So what, what you do is you just define your configuration, and from there you just set and forget it. That agent running on your servers will take care that your configuration stays that way. And short, there's a lot more going on. Uh, why did they do it? Because if you, how many of you read the Monat paper that uh, Jeffrey Snover uh, published several years ago now? Which, okay, nice. What they did in there, they, they, they put uh, their, their thoughts, their roadmap where PowerShell should arrive in the end. And this is one of the last, st there are still, this is one of the last stages that they are now actually implementing it. So this DSC is actually doing uh, the automation of your, co and the maintenance of the configuration of your service. What we will do is, uh, we will show you how you can do this now for vSphere. vSphere has a bit of a problem there, because on your ESX I, for the moment, there is no agent. There is no agent that can check uh, if your configuration, data stores, folders, uh, VMs, is still like it should be. So the most obvious choice would be to run this on your vCenter, but do you really want to load this extra on your vCenter? I'm always in favor of not installing PowerCLI on your vCenter. So don't do it, take another server. And that is where this old solution that I used in the past uh, to access uh, VDI, the view environment, uh, comes into hand. What you do is you take uh, this uh, help server, the VEng, uh, I don't think you will see it in the back, but it's a server, uh, second row to the top on the right. That's where you install your power CLI, and that's where your scripts will actually run. That's where the LCM agent will be running. And why do we do it like that? It's getting better in the latest releases, but in the earlier releases of PowerCLI, there was a bit of overhead if you started PowerCLI. So your first commandlet that you executed could take quite a bit of time. You have been improving that, but still it takes time. So what we do there is we start it up sessions and then we disconnect them. That's something that PowerShell introduced in PowerShell V3. You can work with disconnected sessions. So this overhead of starting your PowerCLI environment only needs to be done once. From there on, every time that this agent is going to check if your configuration is still correct, it will just connect to this help server, as we call it, and it will use one of these disconnected sessions to do his actual stuff. So he will test, for example, if a folder is still there. If it's not, it will create a folder in your vSphere environment. And the big advantage, since it's a disconnected session, it won't take as much time to run such a kind of script as you would with a standalone uh, power CLI session. On the right, I try to summarize here a bit uh, what you should be doing when you want to start using this. First of all, there are, and I forgot to tell that on the previous slide, there are two ways of working. You have a push and a pull method. With push, you're actually telling this agent on the machine, now check and correct if needed. With pull, you just define it, and it will, at regular intervals, check if your configuration is still okay and eventually correct it. 
So pull is the more, more, most obvious one to use. You, you don't need to uh, push uh, commands to the, the servers. Each resource, because Microsoft is obviously at the moment not providing vSphere resources, uh, neither are they uh, resource modules for DSC. So you can write them yourself, and that is the big advantage. You can do scripted resources. It will require you to, to write three types of functions, and they're also quite obvious. There's first of all the third one, which is the test, where the agent will use this function to see if a specific resource is still there. And then, if it's not there, it will use the second function, the set, where you will actually recreate or create that resource. So if the folder is not there, and you see that in the test, the set will uh, recreate the function. The get is used in, in special cases, so I'm not going to go deep into that. What you do, once you have all these resources, these scripts defined, you package them in a module, you put a zip, uh, you zip them, and you put a checksum on there, and you copy them to the pool server. That's, in short, what, what should happen there. Once you have that set up and you have pushed your configuration to the agents, you don't have to bother anymore with the configuration that you defined for that specific vSphere environment. Uh, I know it will be hard to view even for the ones on the first line here, uh, on the first row in, in the room. Microsoft also provided some modules just to define these functions. So what, what happens here, or what you will see later on in the slides, are published is the way how you define what properties are in a specific object that goes along with one of these DSC objects. Uh, in this case, we define something for a folder. So there is, for example, the one that you also always need is the ensure property, which can be present or absent. So that's the way how you define it. So that is quite easy. You have a module to do that. In earlier releases, it was quite a bit longer to do such a definition. The second part, uh, and that's what he I mentioned before, you have at the top left, at the top left, you see these three functions, test, get, and set. And we zoom in a bit on the one that does the testing. That's where you're actually going to verify if your, in this case, it's a folder, if the folder is still there. There are a couple of uh, functions or calls in there that go to this disconnected session, and they execute the script to test if the folder is actually there inside that disconnection. In, inside a disconnected session. Also notice that we use a get view because it's quite important that this happens quite fast. You don't want to, this to be running for several seconds in a row. You want this to be quite fast because it will run at regular intervals. What you see here, and what is important at this point is just the three blocks that you see. You see the top block is, is the red one. So if you, if this agent kicks in, he's first going to check if he still has the correct resources, the definitions for a folder in this case. So he's, he's doing that through the checksum on that zipped module. Secondly, he's going to test if the folder is still there, and he returns. I, I put a, a yellow uh, box around it. He will return true or false if the folder is there, yes or no. And if it's not, like it's the case here, he will recreate the folder. So in summary, this is just verbose output of what this agent is doing. Now, coming back, this is the next subject, uh, coming back on this uh, DSC, what, what we're planning to do is, is put a lot of these resources and the methods, how you can use it, on just like Ellen did with, with uh, VCheck, we put this on GitHub. And that's where we would like now something to get back from the community. We will give you the skeletons, the way how it is done, but we can't obviously not do all the resources. So we would like some input from the community. What specific resources do you want? Uh, even write some of these functions, as we mentioned uh, just a minute ago. So you will see that appearing in the coming weeks after VMworld. A second uh, deep dive uh, subject is we, we see a lot of people using uh, REST APIs, and I know this discussion is uh, quite uh, popular at the moment, REST or no REST, but REST is, I think we had it in your group discussion on Monday. We did, yeah. yeah. So uh, you can use and call REST APIs quite easily from uh, your PowerShell uh, scripts. So what, we, what, what I, uh, I'm going to try to show you here is in PowerShell 4 you have uh, this invoke REST method, it has a few quirks, but it still works. Uh, there's a limit on, on the number of connections that you will accept, but you can easily bypass that. And the second part that goes quasi uh, with these uh, REST APIs is the use of JSON 
as your uh, vehicle or format for your data to go to and from the REST APIs. If you're writing uh, REST APIs, or, or in fact you're writing wrappers, functions around these uh, REST API calls, uh, there are a number of tools that you can use uh, to help you in writing them. I just listed a couple, there are more. Uh, I know, for example, there's also something called Postman, which they uh, use in, in VRO environments quite often. But there's Fiddler. Uh, Chrome has an, an advanced REST client that you can use for testing your functions. Uh, yep. I did do a small video where we showed you, or where we will show you a bit how this can be. Just hit the space bar. Yeah. Okay, what you see here is, uh, or don't see, but you will see it later on when we publish the slides. Uh, we are going to show you that uh, there are some obvious problems with, for example, a date-time object. A date-time object in PowerShell is a quite rich object. It is more than just one property. Uh, and so if you use the built-in convert to JSON function, uh, it will give you back something that you don't expect. And the REST API, by definition, expects your dates to be in a very specific format. Uh, it's uh, the difference in milliseconds, I think, since uh, the 1st of uh, January 1970. So you can easily fix that by, by creating a function yourself, and you don't have to do it in this case. Still, the function will be shown later on on the, on the slides. So, but just take care if you're doing uh, date times in your, in, in your uh, REST API calls, uh, uh, calls make sure that you handle them in the correct format. This is another example. We just uh, simulate uh, date coming back from a, JSON, from a REST API call in a JSON format. Again, if you convert this like that, it will not know that it's a date. It will just show a long integer. So you have to do a special function as well to convert, in this case, to an actual date time object as we know it in PowerShell. So this is the one where we will show, where he shows a long and this is the correct the function one, where you will see that it's actually a date that you're getting back. What we're doing here is, uh, this is just a template, a sample, how you could call one of these uh, REST API methods. Uh, you use a hash table to pass the parameters. You say what method, you give a URL, a URI in this case, and you specify the format of the data to and from the REST API, and you pass some headers along. Headers is, for example, also including the authorization. Now, if we do this call this way, you will see that you easily get back. And this is a sample call, uh, sample call to VRO, I think, where we just uh, check how many plugins are installed in that specific uh, VRO environment. Okay, you can dive in. It's really a structured object that you're getting back from this REST API call. It came back in JSON. It was converted to a PowerShell object. So you can use all your normal techniques that you would use with PowerShell objects to actually investigate or retrieve properties in these objects. Okay, this is just to check that, that we are actually seeing the same data as what was returned with the API method. You can see that the version, for example, of this plugin corresponds with, with uh, in both cases. So this is actually getting the data back. So again, another example, in fact, of, of how you can automate all these environments. You don't have to rely, don't play with GUIs anymore if you're into PowerCLI and PowerShell. We automate. Coming back on that tweet, shut up, automate everything. That's, in fact, the idea behind all this. This is an example of this uh, Chrome plugin where you can simulate, not even simulate, you can do your API calls and you will see all the headers, you will see the output coming back, the raw errors, which could be a problem if you use the invoke REST method because that seems to eat up the actual error code that you're getting back from your API call. So this is very handy tool if you're serious into using REST APIs. Uh, again, the output comes back, uh, as we saw. Okay, we're expanding this one. Okay, this is quite nice. How many of you uh, have been playing with Fiddler from Telerik? Okay, that's a tool that you can use to capture all the traffic to and from a website. You can easily include that in your scripts by adding a proxy which is pointing to your Fiddler interface. 
In that case, you can just start Fiddler, and whatever call you make to your REST API will be captured in your Fiddler tool, where you can investigate. Okay, we run a script, we make a call to the REST API, and now we see the call in here. We go to the right screen, two screens, where we will see the actual input and output of this REST API call. And you can do that in all kinds of formats. You can look at them in, in raw format. You can look in, in JSON format, uh, whatever. You can see the headers. You can see the raw data that is going and coming uh, from these REST APIs. So this is definitely a tool to be in your tool belt if you're serious about uh, using REST API calls from your PowerShell environment. Okay, this is what he gave back as a JSON object. It's the same call we did before, so you know. This is actually one element in that array that he gave back with all the plugins in that environment. Can you switch it? Yep. Okay, uh, REST API, it looks daunting, but it's quite easy once you get the hang of it. And like uh, we said already several times during this session, don't reinvent the wheel feel free to steal of what is available in your environment. That rhymes. Uh, well, <laughs> we should make that a slogan somewhere. That was good. <laughs> okay, just as a reference, these are these two date functions that I mentioned earlier. So once the slides appear, you can check here. Don't reinvent, reuse, or steal. Uh, this is something else, and this is an example that I quite recently saw in the community. Uh, people wanted, okay, the, the question here is, is quite simple. He has a number of virtual switches. They all end in a suffix. I think most of us do it that way. And he wanted to know the next free number. Now, it's not because that question is so interesting. It's the way you can solve this. You all know the select object commandlet, where you can pull out properties of a specific uh, PowerShell ob object. But the select string one is a bit more unknown, I'm afraid. There you can, from a text stream, pull out information. And you can do that through a regular expression. So what we did here is we just display all the virtual switches, pull out the name, and then extract the numeric data at the end, which is the number of your vSwitch. And then it's just a matter, as you see in the second to last line, of using the maximum and adding one to get the next free number. So a conclusion here, if you're Willing to take your PowerShell, Power CLI to the next level, make sure that you start using regular expressions. And select string is also quite interesting in that case. This is also a question. I think Alan already mentioned that earlier. We see a lot of, of questions. How, how do we know if we want to go, if we, if we have to go in these API calls, how do we know what to use, what properties to use, what method to use? Now, there are two methods to do this, and I'll quickly show you both of them. The first one is the one I prefer. It's the book and the logic. So you just make sure that you know the API reference by heart, and you know what to use. But no, not serious. Uh, you just go and... That's what he it, does. That's what he does. That's okay, but that's not what you should do. Uh, if you know what, what, what you're looking for, in this case, the question was, how do I know, uh, how can I activate a health check on a virtual distributed switch? So just be logical about it. There are a number of managed objects in your vSphere environment. One of them is a distributed virtual switch. So the obvious choice is start on that one in the reference guide. That's what you see in this screenshot. Now, okay, manage objects, we go there, we go to distributed virtual switch. When I'm on the distributed virtual switch, I always try, and that's the first option I do, I do Control F, which is find, and you, ch and you find health in this case. And oh my, I'm lucky, there seems to be a method that has the word health in it. So when I click, because these are all hyperlinks, when I click on that uh, hyperlink, I come to the method, in fact, that tells me how to do this. Once I have this method, I can go to the actual task, and uh, as you see at the bottom there, there is a number of, of objects that I have to define, that's these spec uh, objects that we have to define to pass to the task. Okay. <laughs> we added this one because we wanted to maximize our evaluation points, and so this way we get all the cat lovers on our side for this session. The second method, and I'm quite excited, 
I'm not a big fan. You need to use it in, with caution, but this is also quite exciting. They brought out something recently that is called the Onyx web client. You ha who has been using Onyx before? Before there was a web. So you had a lot of customers. And who was disappointed that you couldn't do that with the web client anymore? So they listen to you. That's what happens in Alan's big book. And he uh, brings that book regularly to Bulgaria and they code it. In this case, they introduced the uh, Onyx web client. You plug, it's a plugin in your, uh, in your web. Yeah, yeah, there's a real book, uh, <laughs> if you don't believe me. So you just have this. And that's what we're going to use here in this case. Now, this makes it a lot easier. Uh, and they couldn't have made it more easy than, than this case. You click the record button in this case, which is universal, will also be on your VCR and whatever. You click your record button and you start doing what you want to trigger, or what you want to capture. In this case, virtual switch, you select the edit hull check. And then when you click this, perhaps not very visible for everyone in the room, but on the right there is this small power CLI icon. When you click that, you get actually the code that was used behind uh, this GUI or web client action that you did. And as if you look later on when the slides is available, if you look very clear, uh, closely, you will see that we ended up with the same method as the K method, in fact, than we just found in the other method. Now, there are some words of warning. This is translating what it captures in the traffic from the web client to the vSphere environment. So it translates it literally. You won't find the method, uh, you won't find the, the procedure, how we will translate, for example, a virtual, distributed virtual switch name into that managed object reference that you see appearing in this code. So you can't just use it like that. You have to think before you start using it in your own code. But it's another way of finding what you, and since we had the cat lovers in the previous ones, we are now going for the dog lovers, maximize the score, Ellen, and yeah. we think we are safe. I need to swap. Just don't leave yet. Alan has. So I know we're a little bit over time, but um, and I have no internet, so this yep. isn't going to work. So whatever. <laughs> that's that's why we don't do live demos. By this the way, this is why we don't do live demos. Anyway, um, that was going to be a survey about what you want next, but I'm sure you all know by now. You can reach out to me. You can talk to me. You can tell me what you want next. Uh, we want to thank you for coming to this session. We want to thank you for keep asking us to go deeper and keep asking us even more and hopefully we'll be able to present this again to you next year with even more. Um, please do fill out the survey. My, my favorite number is five. I'm not sure about you, Luke. 4.9 is okay. 4.9? Okay. 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 So 4.9 for Luke, five for me. Um, but yeah, seriously, fill out the survey. You know, we do look at the comments. We try and make it better for, for people that were comments in there as well. As is unfortunately, nothing we can do about our accents, which is something that does get raised. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. Thank you.